You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Lisa Wilkinson was standing in the canned food aisle at her local supermarket, trying to decide between lemon vinaigrette tuna or oven dried tomatoes. She was holding a can in her hand when her phone rang. She answered the call, and what came next? Well, it rocked her, and it rocked the country. I had a moment where I thought, I know I just heard that, but did that just come over the loudspeaker? Like, is everybody who's wandering around this supermarket right now, did they hear that as well? Because that phone call was from Lisa's manager, Nick, and he was calling her to say that it was over. Channel 9 would not be renewing her contract as co-host of The Today Show. After 10 years, Lisa's time at The Today Show had been called and there was no one more shocked than her. From Mamma Mia, you're listening to No Filter, a podcast where people from all walks of life tell their stories very candidly and aren't afraid to be vulnerable. My name is Mia Friedman and over the next two episodes... You're going to hear the story of Lisa Wilkinson. But it's Lisa Wilkinson like you have never heard her before. I've known Lisa since I was 19. And this is the third time that I've spoken to her for No Filter. She's one of my closest friends in the world and has been for decades. But this is the first time that we've sat in the studio for two hours talking nonstop about every inch of her life. Because Lisa has lived lots of different lives in her 61 years. She's been a magazine editor, a TV host, a mum, an ambassador, a political commentator, a friend and a mentor to many. But she's been a whole lot more than that, more than anyone knew. At 15, Lisa was sexually abused. At 21, she became the editor of Dolly magazine. At 25, she was holding her own in a shouting match with Kerry Packer as the editor of Clio magazine. By her early 40s, she transitioned to TV. And by 47, she'd taken what was then known as the poison chalice of breakfast telly as Carl Stefanovic's fourth co-host in just a couple of years. And 10 years later, she made one of the biggest deals in Australian TV history. Lisa has written an incredible memoir, aptly called It Wasn't Meant to Be Like This. Because for Lisa, well, she thought her life really wasn't meant to be like this. And today, we're talking about all of it. Here's part one of my very intimate, vulnerable and candid conversation with Lisa Wilkinson. And just a heads up, this episode deals with the topic of sexual assault. So if you need help, please call 1-800-RESPECT. I once read that a girl gets her self-confidence from her mother and her self-esteem from her father. Does that ring true for you? Say that one more time. I've really got to think about that. I should have said it the other way around. A girl gets her self-esteem from her father and her self-confidence from her mother. And they're slightly different things. They are different things. Did that ring true for you? Without misrepresenting my mother because, as you know, Mia, having read the book, my mother is a huge figure in this book. Yeah. In many ways, it was the life that my mother was handed as an illegitimate child. In those days, she would have been called a bastard Mm -hmm. to a young single mother who spent most of her early years in an orphanage because her mother didn't want her. And how my mother found ways to lift herself out of that and yet carried the burden of her childhood, Mm. her entire life, and didn't, as a woman, get to live with the sort of freedoms that I have, having Mm. been born at a a time time. when feminism was really starting to, to take shape and form up and wake us up as women. So there's much of my mother's story that has not only driven me forward, but has inspired what I've done. And I think my mother would be flawed to know that that's the case. 
But to answer your original question, I think I got both of those things from my incredible father, who also plays a pretty significant role in the book and, and of course, the life that I've, I've had. You know, he, he died back in 1990, but, you know, I feel him with me every single day. Is it a book you could have written before your mum died? No, because I don't think mum would have been comfortable mm. with what I said. And, and in saying that, once again, I would love to think that mum could sit on my shoulder and read that book now and be proud of herself, which I don't think my yeah. mother ever was when she was on this earth. But there was a lot of pain in mum's early life and I don't think she would have been comfortable mm. with that being out there because mum was an incredibly humble woman. She came from really poor beginnings and a mother who my mother neglected was, her in neglected the worst her. way yeah. and abused her. Your life has been so different, you know, as a, what are we, second wave, third wave feminism. I always forget the number of waves. But we've been <laughs> surfing them for a very long time. There's been many a wave <laughs> and how did she see your fame and your success? She was uncomfortable with it because my mother was rejected so much in her early years that I think mum would see me putting myself out there. She never understood where my courage came from. She never understood why I would continually, you know, say yes to these huge jobs with mm. a public profile where, you know, you can so easily get a bad headline or people can criticise you, you know. And certainly as I moved more into journalism where I was doing political interviews, I was interviewing prime ministers and, you know, mum's politics sort of lent a little more towards Alan Jones than <laughs> me. Um, Pretty far right, yeah. Beryl. And, you know, again, I think about the times that mum grew up in and, you know, sometimes I'd interview one of our many prime ministers over the last seven or eight that I've interviewed mm. and I would ring mum and I'd if I was proud of the interview and I'd ring her and say oh did you did you see me with Tony Abbott this morning and, and mum would say yeah I didn't really agree with you who's doing your hair at the moment I'm really not sure <laughs> That they're, I don't think they should be doing your hair darling a little bit too much makeup and it's just like I love you, Mum, because you, you're my greatest supporter, but you just, you struggle with your daughter putting herself out there. And Did you ever feel like you got her approval? I know Mum was proud of me, but I think she found it really difficult mm. because in Mum's mind, if she articulated that, it would mean that I would probably push myself out there a little bit more, which mm. she never wanted. And yet in some ways, when I look back at how I've lived my life, I think I have tried to live a life that my mum never got the opportunity mm. to live. Mm. I do know that she was proud of me. But the greatest joy of mum's life was that I could give her three grandchildren. Mm. That was where joy really kicked in for mum. One area of our lives as women that our mothers are very influential in is our body image, particularly when you were growing up and when I was growing up. I don't know if you had – oh, you used to read Dolly magazine, I think. Oh, yeah. Did you? Oh, religiously. Yeah. It was my Bible. But what did your mum teach you about body image, both in what she said to you and the way you saw her behave about her own body? Because that's the greatest teacher, isn't it, what we see our mums do? Yeah. As a parent, I've always believed that you teach the most important lessons when you think your kids aren't watching. Yeah. And what the did you learn? They're what watching all the time. Well, you know, I grew up in the 70s when ads for Ford pills were on the TV. What were Ford pills for those who don't know? They were basically a combination of laxatives and probably speed, I think. And I remember there was one ad where the woman used to walk through this cardboard cutout of sliding female shapes, you know, sort of an hourglass figure. I remember one woman walking through who was, you know, in inverted commas, fat, who wanted to be skinny, but here, take these Ford pills because mm. your husband will start looking at you again in the way he's currently looking at his secretary. Oh, wow. So she would take the Ford pills and she would come back 
like super duper 70s Woodstock style skinny and they could push the little slides in and she would walk through in her bikini knowing that her man would look at her again. So they were the messages that I was getting watching TV and were inculcated into every woman of my mother's age. You know, going through high school from the age of five, I did ballet. It was the joy of my life. And I can say as a grown woman now, I was bloody good at it. Mm. In fact, I was constantly winning every championship there was in the state. And I loved it. What happened? You grew boobs. No, no, I didn't grow boobs. I got bullied at school. And, you know, being good at anything, if you're being bullied, is a signal that you should probably pull back because you're just making yourself a bigger target. But doing ballet for all of those years, you know, I was out there exercising Mm. four times a week and going to a Steadfords and doing all of that. I had a ballerina's figure. And even though I grew boobs, it didn't matter because that was my joy. But when I was being bullied, I decided to stop ballet because I was doing everything I could to disappear between the cracks. And I started to put on a little bit of weight. And I think mum's fear of me being rejected came through at that point. I remember her saying to me one day, oh, darling, darling, you, you look like you're putting on quite a lot of weight if you just lost some of that weight, I think you'd find that, you know, you'd be batting the boys away with a stick. Oh, how old were you then? Um, I was probably about 16. Oh. 16 into 17. And it was one of those things where I just thought, I didn't really notice I'd been putting on weight. I mean, I wasn't feeling as comfortable in my skin because I wasn't doing all of the, the ballet that I once was. But I remember thinking... I don't really know what to do with that because if boys look at me through the lens of whether or not I'm slim, that's not the kind of boy that I want. And is that the lens through which mum is looking at me now? But I had to constantly, as I started to know more about mum's story, which dad told me, you know, sort of meted it out so that it Mm. was... Because she didn't tell you. No, Mm. no, she told me a lot later in life. Mm. But in those early times when, you know, I was doing the typical argy-bargy with your mum that you do when you're a teenage girl. And dad tried to be the peacemaker so that I would understand mum's backstory and see some of the moods she would sometimes get in. I would understand where that all came from. thoughtful and rational but as a girl at, at 16 who's trying to find herself at that age and it was around that time that you had that uh, experience of sexual assault, how did that impact on how you felt about your body? Well, it was all happening at exactly the same time. It was 15 and it was a, a friend's father who also happened to be a, a man that my father knew well because Dad was president of the local Lions Club and this man was a member of the Lions Club. Prominent in the community. Well, this man wasn't, but my father was. My, mm-hmm. my dad was a very charity-minded and community-minded man. And um, it happened twice and the second time that it happened was worse than the first time. Uh, The first time was in public and the second time he cornered me in the laundry at my friend's house and somewhere deep inside and this is something that um, I don't know where my courage comes from sometimes but when I I realised what was going on, Mm. I just got out of there Mm. but I remember freezing. And I remember thinking, what have I done? How is it that he thinks this is okay? This is my friend's father. Mm. My friend's mother is just in there. But for some reason he thinks this is okay. 
But I managed to get out of there and I was meant to be having a sleepover, but I was feeling uncomfortable and I'd asked Dad, would he mind coming and picking me up at six o'clock? And I'd actually gone into the laundry because my friend's dog had had some puppies and I'd gone in to see the puppies because I was trying to kill time before Dad arrived. And this moment happened and... I just got out of there and I raced towards the door because I thought, Dad can't be far away. And then I heard the knock and went to the door and my friend's father arrived at the door right behind me because he wanted to make sure that I knew I better stay quiet. He didn't tell me to stay quiet. But all of those things race through your head of, and I'm sure this is true for so many survivors, because often staying silent is a way of surviving. Mm. But I thought, if I tell Dad, what happens now? If I tell my friend, what happens now? What does the other side of telling this secret look like? And all of it looked painful. It was just easier to stand there and then almost as if it was happening in slow motion I saw my friend's father put his hand straight out and it was exactly the same hand that had just been on my body and reach for my father's hand and there was my beautiful father you know his face beaming because one of the many men in the Lions Club had just hosted his daughter for the afternoon and he was so pleased to see him and and I just said nothing and went home. I'm so sorry that happened to you. It should never have happened to you. Well, the hard part was telling my girlfriend recently because she was so sorry and I never wanted to hear those words from her because it wasn't her fault. It's no one's fault except the perpetrator. And what I've discovered is that man was more of a monster than I ever could have imagined because she's, in more recent times, had to discover the extent of the abuse that um, he visited upon others. And in many ways, I got off very lightly. Who was the first person that you told? Pete. When I read that, because I'd never heard that story from you before, and when I read that, all I could think of was Pete's reaction. Hmm. Fortunately, this man died in yeah. the 80s and, um, yeah. When did you tell Pete? How long after you guys got together? Oh, not long after. Um, what made you decide to tell him? Because he wasn't your first relationship. It wasn't, you know, why Pete? Why then? I think partly because saying it out loud took a lot of courage and I think I needed to be in a really safe environment to do it because it's only once you finally start talking about it Mm. that it becomes really, really real. When someone tells you that that happened to them, what's the best response? What did Pete do? He just listened. Mm. That's the best response. Just let someone speak. Yeah. Yeah, which... If we fast forward to Brittany Higgins earlier this year, obviously as a journalist I've got to ask questions because that was a huge story and at this point they remain allegations. And I was never going to include what happened to me in the book because I didn't think I could deal with, just as I did when I was 15, what the other side of that looked like Mm. because it's always What were you scared of? Not being believed. Wow. That's what most survivors fear, that you won't be heard, you Mm. won't be believed. But what became so apparent to me after Brittany Higgins was that, I mean, for starters, just the month after Brittany told her story so courageously, reports of sexual abuse went up I think it was 40%. It might have yeah. been 60%. Mm. They went through the roof mm. because women realised 
that they would be heard, that they would be believed and that they would no longer be seen as the one who should feel bad about it. The only person who should feel bad and feel guilty is the perpetrator. And I've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of women tell me their stories since Brittany. How do you deal with that though? You know, every story is heartbreaking, but also you're carrying the weight of your own story. That's why I had to tell my story. And I think for a lot of people, there's been an understanding of why this has been such an important issue for me Mm. as a journalist for a very long time Mm. and child protection issues and um, women's health services and, Mm. you know, all of those charities that do such incredible work. But until now, the silence has been the great friend of perpetrators. Mm. And unless we talk about it, unless we all link arms and say this happened to me too, the silence continues. And you would like to think after the watershed moment that this year has been for so many women that there's abusers out there who think twice, who think that, you know, Mm. at least part of the game is up and that maybe that young woman won't stay silent this time. I want to shift gears and ask you about a type of diversity that's often not discussed, which is class. You are a rich and famous and glamorous woman living in a fancy house highly successful, but you didn't start out that way, hence the name of your book. It wasn't meant to be like this. And I think that's something that perhaps people don't understand, that if someone's in the public eye, they've always been very, very privileged because class diversity is something that you can't see on the outside and is often not spoken about. What are some of the things about your childhood and growing up, would people never, ever guess about you looking at you now and looking at your life now and talking about privilege? It's actually very difficult to look at yourself from the outside. I mean, I hope when people read the book, if people have only seen you on television, if they've only seen you you know, on the carpet at the Logies. the Logies, which most people have. Yeah. That's their experience. Beautiful dresses that are not yours, that are purely for the cameras. Hair and makeup done. That are all about, you know, presenting a certain kind of vibe. Then you do come across as, as the person that you don't see yourself as. I mean, I still, to this very day, know that I am a kid from the western suburbs of Sydney who, through a love of Dolly magazine, was a magazine junkie who lucked out big time. Mm -hmm. Every step of the way from, you know, going to the local public school. I did 13 years of public schooling. I didn't understand private schooling until I went to business college in the city. And it was a business college that was kind of for ladies from the country and almost all of the girls that I met at business college all went to private school and I can remember you know when you when you say business college was it kind of like secretarial school yeah it was yeah absolutely how to type typing shorthand business studies something to um, do before you got married yeah and had babies and that's what all of these girls were doing because a lot of them were from the country Mm. and it was all about I discovered for most of them, they'd all gone to boarding school in the city and then they were going to go back to the country and marry a rich landowner, but they would have a skill, Mm. which is what we were all told to do in the 70s as women, you know, have a skill to back you up just in case you don't land that guy. Mm. What were you there for? That's what they were all there for. Is that why you were there? I wanted to get into journalism, but I had this burning desire to go travelling. I wanted to see Europe. I wanted to be a journalist, but I also thought, I feel like I've lived this really 
sort of cloistered life in the suburbs mm. and I know that there's a big wide world out there and I grew up watching shows like the Mary Tyler Moore show. I just wanted to be a journalist but I thought I don't have any stories yet and I don't feel like I've got a proper perspective on the world so I want to go backpacking and I want to fall in love with a guy, you know, a bad boy in a cafe in Morocco <laughs> and I want to live out of the back of a combi van and I want to meet people that I would never normally meet. So how that it, go? Well, I went to business college and I was an excellent student because I was meeting people that I would never normally meet. But in those early conversations when you're kind of sitting around the lunchroom with girls your age but with very different experiences, you know, the conversation always goes, so where did you grow up? And I would say Campbelltown. I sort of clocked every time a look on their face like, Hmm, that's cute. That's Explain kind Campbelltown of... for those not in Sydney. Western suburbs of Sydney, absolutely mm. working but class. Far west. Yeah. Yeah. Well Quite in far west. deep yeah. west. And I would not change a thing of my childhood. I had the most wonderful childhood with beautiful grandparents on my father's side. And we used to go to the local river to swim and one of the most exciting days of my life was when we finally had a public swimming pool and I had, you know, a few really wonderful teachers who encouraged me throughout school. But, you know, it was a really average growing up. We didn't have much money. Dad was a hardworking sales manager who worked in um, – had to drive to work every day and mum was, you know, called a housewife – Mum didn't drive. You know, that lack of confidence came through in a lot of what mum did or didn't do. Mm. And so these girls that you met at secretarial school, business college. Yeah, and I would say, well, I'm I'm from Campbelltown. And I just always noticed that there was a little reaction there. Like a raised slight raised eyebrow. And what I discovered was the next question that came up, it was like, that's okay, we can fix that because you might have gone to a good school. So the next question was, oh, but where did you go to school? Which I always thought was a weird question because there was only one high school in Campbelltown. There were two Catholic schools and they sat on hills either side of town. But, you know, I wasn't Catholic. So I went to the local infants, primary and high school. And there was always this look of, oh, well, you seem like a nice girl. We might still give you a shot. (laughs) Lucky you. So I went to business college and the idea was to get shorthand and typing, which you needed to be a journalist. And I thought if I can get a job somewhere close to the media for a year, I'll just stay living at home. I'll work really hard, save up, I'll go overseas and then I'll come back and try and get a cadetship somewhere with all of that experience under my belt. And maybe some sweet memories of that boy in the cafe in Morocco. (laughs) But the very first day that I went to look for a job, I went to the Sydney Morning Herald, to their employment pages, which back in those days were separated into men and boys and women and girls. And as you can imagine, Mia, the men and boys section went on for page after page after page. And there were a couple of columns for the women and girls. And so it didn't take long to go through alphabetically and it didn't take long to get to the letter D because there was an ad there that said Dolly Magazine is looking for a secretary stroke editorial assistant stroke girl Friday who is prepared to do absolutely anything. Phone Kathy on 699 3622. And I did and somehow I got the job. I'm Mia Friedman and you're listening to part one of my chat with Lisa Wilkinson. I could talk to you obviously for 800 years about magazines because I'm here because of you and because of Dolly. And it's funny when someone who was your idol then becomes your boss and then your mentor and then your friend. I consider myself very fortunate. But the one question I want to ask you, which I wasn't around for at Clio, was when you had to tell Kerry Packer that you were putting a bullet in his beloved centrefold, putting a staple (laughs) in his beloved centrefold and replacing it with something new. That was a big chance. Why did you decide to do that and what was his reaction? I decided to do it because when I took over Cleo, it 
it was feeling like a bit of a relic of the 70s. And even though the centrefold was really clever, and it was both Kerry and Ida Buttrose that started Clio, and, you know, even though editorially Ida was obviously the brains behind it, this was the first media outing for young Kerry Packer because his father, Sir Frank, was still alive at that point, And he was the second son. Clyde was before him. And so this was a magazine that had been a massive success. And Kerry, How long after you got there did you decide to change the centrefold? I pretty much decided as soon as I was offered the job. Mm. And I'd originally told Kerry Packer I didn't want the job, which he didn't quite understand. Mm. And I said to him, look, you don't understand. I mean, I've been at Fairfax and they have no idea what it is that I've done over the last four years that's tripled the circulation. They don't get it. And they're more than happy not to get it Mm -hmm. because the guys in charge are mostly in their 60s and 70s. And they're just counting the money. They're counting the money. Mm. They can't quite believe how much is coming in and how good I am at making it for them. And they just figure if they leave me alone, I'll just keep making a lot of money for them. But I don't think you run a business like that. Mm. And I'm cool with that because you've come after me. I've heard the stories about you. I don't really want to work for you. And I think you'll interfere. And I'll take out the expletives. But it it was basically I'll FFS. (laughs) (laughs) FFS, yeah. I'm about to pay you a lot of money for you to do that job as if I want to do it myself. Ooh, good comeback, Kerry. Great comeback. Yeah. And there was just, there was something about the clear independence that he Mm. was going to give me combined with the fact that this was a magazine that could really hold its head high Mm. for women in the 70s in Australia. It was really the first magazine Mm. that for women, you know, who were no longer girls. It was a feminist icon as a a brand. Totally. You know, it told women that, you know, we could be financially independent. We could be in charge of our own bodies. We could be in charge of our own pleasure. We could study. We could be a politician. We could storm the trenches and win. And so the idea of taking over that magazine was, Mm. you know, I was 25 at the time. It was just a little bit too intoxicating for me to say no to. But you didn't want naked men with cheesy well, I, props draped over their yeah, parts. Yeah, when the centrefold started, it was saying, you boys have got your Playboy centrefolds and we've mm, got It was this. feminist. That's right. And yeah. Jack Thompson, who was a huge star in the early 70s in Australia, an actor, He'd done the very first one and, you know, groups like Skyhooks, even the Sydney Swans AFL team had posed for it. But it was like 13 years later. It's just like are we still yeah. having the same joke. Did he push back? He didn't because he didn't really get the opportunity because his number two, a guy called Trevor Kennedy, who was really my go-to mm-hmm. on a daily basis if I needed to talk to anyone Mm. in management. I told Trevor and Trevor said, oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I'll let Kerry know. And so the day my very first issue came out, I was asked to go on Ray Martin's midday show, which was a terrifying experience in itself. And it also turned out to be the very same studio where I used to host the Today Show Ah. many years later. So a lot happened in that space for me. And So I went on Ray Martin's Midday Show and the news was Lisa Wilkinson has dropped the centrefold and tell us why, Lisa, and I told Ray Martin, which meant telling all of Australia. And I came off air and as I was walking back up to the green room, which is where everybody goes before and after you appear on television, there was a producer who was calling out as I was walking up the stairs saying, is Lisa Wilkinson around anywhere? And I sort of called out, yeah, here I am. And I walked into the green room and this poor woman, like all colour had drained from her face. And it was a landline phone as it Uh was back in those days. And I could see the cord from the phone sort of pulled really tight and disappearing between her legs. And she said, Carrie Packer's on the phone. 
And I thought, that's okay because Kerry and I actually had a really good relationship yep. and he always said to me, call me Kerry. Yeah. And so I did and I thought, that's also good because we're on mm. an even playing field. I know he's my boss. I know he's really rich but he wanted me and I, you know, sort of went into work with the power of that every single day. She said, Kerry Packer's on the phone. And I said, oh, that's fine. And as she handed me this really clammy, warm <laughs> phone, I thought, I wonder what this is going to be about. And she said, you know, Kerry Packer never calls here. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this could be interesting. And I thought, okay, be confident, Lisa, because I knew that he'd been in the States. And I said, hi, Kerry, I actually thought you were overseas. How are you? And there was just silence. And I said, are you there, Kerry? And he said, what the fuck have you just done? <laughs> Did you want to vomit? I didn't have enough time <laughs> to get the regurgitating <laughs> reflex happening because I had to get my brain into yeah. gear because I figured I might be about to be sacked and if I don't go down fighting, mm. I will be letting down the Campbelltown girl inside. So I just thought I've got to be confident about the decision that I made because I was convinced it was the right decision. I said in return, oh, FFS, Kerry, if you're talking about the centrefold, you must be joking. And then I just went on Ooh. this rant about if anyone who works in magazines thinks that keeping the centrefold, I mean, for heaven's sake, we're now in the mid-80s, Kerry. <laughs> the go-ahead <laughs> <the> Yes, exactly. <laughs> So the best form of defence is attack and you just went for I, it on the front foot. I went for it in a way wow. that almost scared me. Yeah. And his response was, well, you better fucking know what you're doing. And then he slammed the phone down. And you did. Well, it faltered a little bit. Like taking away the centrefold at that time when that was exactly what that magazine was known for, mm. the audience kind of went, oh, so what is this magazine now? Sometimes props can really work for a brand. And so I think a lot of women kind of want, oh, okay, oh, that's that girl from Dolly that's now running this. And we'd sort of changed around the graphics. And I'd also done something that was really stupid as I look back. If I wanted to make a statement about the magazine, apart from taking out the centrefold, I also decided to change the logo mm. with my very first issue and it was quite a few months later when I realised that at great expense to ACP Management, mm. which was the name of the company at the time, Kerry's company, they had in the early 70s put up hoardings at every newsagent oh, in to. all of Australia that had the Clio logo you in it. You still see that old logo They're very still occasionally. Around. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. every night when they turn Even the switch Clio's on gone. so that there's a pool of light outside the shop, there's a Clio logo from yeah. 1972 so that's still sitting there. So I kind of confused the audience. Yeah. But tragically, at around about the same time, the AIDS epidemic was happening and I could see that Cleo had an enormous role to play when mm. it came to safe sex. Mm. And so in some ways women came to the magazine through no specific work of mine yeah. but for safe, safe information. Yeah, yeah. And so it kind of evened out mm. and then women just got what we Took were doing off. and I had such an incredible group of women working on that magazine and – you will know Best how much in my life. fun it was so working fun. there. And, you know, when we sat down in those meetings, our egos were left at the door and our personal stories entered mm. that room. And we did a magazine that was for us. Mm. Mm. And I think, you know, between everybody who worked there, we really represented mm. such a broad cross-section of Australian women that, you know, we were able to really hit the zeitgeist. So that's part one. And there is a lot more to come. You know, as I said at the start, I've been friends with Lisa for 25 years or so. And we have shared some of the highest highs and the lowest lows in our private and professional lives. But there were things that I never knew about when I read this book and when we had this conversation. On my next chat with Lisa, here's a little bit 
about what's coming up. Because I also felt a bit foolish. Because I just thought, I don't even know what this relationship is. I don't... This is purely just a relationship for the cameras. And I couldn't talk to him for two hours. Apart from what was scripted, I just couldn't talk to him. For the first time in over a decade, I didn't trust myself that I was going to play nice. It Wasn't Meant to Be Like This by Lisa Wilkinson is published by HarperCollins and it's available now for pre-order on Booktopia. Run, Don't Walk, this is going to be the book of the year and you will absolutely love it. The assistant producer of No Filter is Lucy Neville. The executive producer is Eliza Ratliff. I'm Mia Friedman and I'll see you on Mamma Mia. And if you want something else to listen to, We have a new show. I think it's our 45th podcast. It's called What Are You Wearing? And it's the podcast for your wardrobe. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures.